Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for a, a seamless change from one day to another. And Lord, we've seen faces we haven't seen in a while. So thankful for that. Grateful for your movement in other people's lives, for hearing the prayers of the saints, for those who stand up. The, the, what we've been hearing here is, is that we stay in the fight. And Lord, that's what you wish for us to do. We as a group of people have come because we are servants of the one most high. And we are reading through Mark, learning how to be like the perfect servant, like Jesus. How can we be closer? Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be closer, to be better in a time when things are more difficult, but the opportunities are far greater. Lord, we pray, Father, that we would open this word and that you would speak the word, Lord. That it wouldn't be my words and my ideas and my thoughts and my actions, but yours and yours alone. That you would use the talents you've given me as an orator, and that's it. That's all I want this to be is you and your trusted word. And that it would go down and it would bury itself in the hearts of those who hear it both here and out there on YouTube and whoever else gets an opportunity to listen, I pray, Father, that it would grab them and hold them and bear fruit. Father, be with us, lead us, and guide us in all of your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we've been going through the book of Mark. I don't think it's a mistake to continue to reiterate the idea of why we chose this book. There's four gospels, and we have a lot of reason to be in each one, but in the vernacular of the things that we do as a as a uh, a group as a first responder military fire police you know in in the jails um we know that we have a certain heart to serve people in a little bit different way the book of mark was written because it proves that jesus is the perfect servant it was written for rome rome didn't care what you had to say they only cared about what you did. And so this is Jesus doing what he did best. Just being him, a perfect servant. And so that's where we've been. And as we continue to move on there, what do we continue to glean out of the word of God from Jesus' mouth himself as to understand who it is he is and who we can be as we get closer to him? Because let's face it, the world here, doesn't have anything to do with our future. We're just be, we're just hanging out, right? We are sojourners in a foreign land waiting for our call home. And oh, what a glorious day that'll be. So as we get ourselves here to chapter 8, we're going to step up and see the story of the feeding of the 4,000. Now, this is not the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to talk very very specifically about that because there's a lot of naysayers that say that the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000 are the same story. We'll start off by debunking the idea based on details that are very clearly given in the scriptures and the idea that we need to read the book, we need to read the book in a very normal way. We too many people cut and snip and snap and take words and put them in re and reorganize their thoughts to make the word fit their beliefs. We can't do that. The word of God is written in a specific way for a specific time. And that time is now. So what we need to know is why is this story in Mark and in Matthew two times, quite frankly, the same miracle, but in different ways. Well, we know that the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four. But the feeding of the 4,000 is only in Matthew and Mark. And although Mark is the first person to write a gospel, Matthew took a lot of details out of it. It just doesn't make any common sense. There's no common sense in idea that Mark would write this, forget, and write about it again. And then Matthew would see it and say, well, I'm going to forget and write it again. That doesn't make any sense. And so there's specifically a reason why this story is in there. People like to think that it's the same story. Well, point number one, the people who are involved are different. How do we know that? Well, look at chapter 8, verse 1. It says, in those days. Well, in those days means 
in the same days that the things that are going on in chapter 7 have been going on. We know that if we've covered chapter 7, that after the debilitating argument that Jesus has with the Pharisees about washing their hands, and then making a statement about the idea that, that it doesn't matter what you ingest that defiles you, it's what comes from inside outwards that defiles us, it's from what's the heart. Jesus does only what he does best. That is, talk about it and then prove it in a physical sense. And so he takes his, his, his apostles and they go up to Tyre and Sidon. Well, up in Tyre and Sidon is the Syrophoenician uh, lo- land up in what's the modern day Lebanon. They are off the, mat- the, the Mediterranean coast. She, they go up there. I, my favorite line in, in, in chapter 7 in the section there, verse 24 and on, says that Jesus wishes to be hidden. Jesus can't be hidden. He is the light of the world. And if in Matthew chapter 5 he said, Ah, oh, you don't put a light under a basket. You put it on a lampstand. How does Jesus then disappear in the midst of someone? Somebody heard about him. Somebody knew about him. Somebody sought him out. It was a woman who had a, who had a demon-possessed child, right? So at this point, the apostles start to see Jesus differently. Because Jesus was a Jew, he was raised as a Jew, and he's teaching his new brand or his new band of, of religion, quite frankly. Remember, he needed to change the narrative. Because the Jews, well, they, they thought that they were super special and that everybody else, Gentiles, were below them. That wasn't God's heart. God called Abraham out said, make a new nation, take that nation and bless the world with your nation. But the the prideful arrogance of the Jews failed in this. So Jesus is doing almost exactly what God called Israel to do. Jesus has called his apostles to do. That is, take in what I have to teach, show you that my faithfulness is there, and then spread it out to the rest of the world. We know that that happened and that worked because Christianity is worldwide now. And we're getting to that point where everybody's heard the gospel. And Matthew, and, and in the Olivet Discourse in chapter 24, Jesus said it goes out to everyone across the world, and then the end comes. We're standing on that time. But Jesus needs to flip the script, and he needs to show that there is no partiality in God. God doesn't have any partiality. It's not about who you are, it's what you do. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 2 really quick, I could read it for you. It's just a kind of a banging home of this idea. Romans chapter 2 verse 6 says, and it's in, it starts in the middle of the sentence, but it says, God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good speak for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jews first and then the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Jesus needs to make it known that God cares so much for the Jews, his people, his people, quote unquote, but the Gentiles too, that there is no partiality. So as we are walking through the idea, they leave Tyre and Sidon, like we talked about last time. They come down around the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee into the Decapolis, which is 10 cities, all of which were Roman provinces run by Gentiles. So in those days when he's healing Gentiles in the the Decapolis, we immediately see it's different from the feeding of the 5,000 Jews. The Jews and the Gentiles. Now think about it. What does it mean when he does this incredible miracle for his people, the Jews, then he does this incredible same miracle for the Gentiles? 100% of humanity is covered here. All people, Jews and Gentiles. 
So the Jews can't say, well, Jesus did that for us, but he didn't do it for you. Therefore, we're back. we can't, can't play that game. This is all the Jews want, is the ability to prove that they're better than everybody else. That's, they're still in that place. And so we know that that's a difference. The location is different. We know that Bethsaida, somewhere around the kind of the wilderness out there is where they fed the 5,000. The, the 4,000 is in the Decapolis. And if you look down at the very end of this section in, in verse uh, 10, it says, in, it says immediately got into a boat with the disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Dalmanutha is, Mag, is Magdala, which is where Mary was born. She was Mary of Magdala, of Magdalene. But they're directly west of the Sea of Galilee. So they had to go from the east to the west across there in a boat. So we know that we're dealing with and still in the Decapolis. Jesus' heart continues to minister to Gentiles. And I'm glad because I'm a Gentile and that he has brought his love and grace to us that way. We know that the vocabulary is a little bit different. This is kind of an interesting deal. If you read the 5,000, it says they took up 12 small baskets of scraps. The word basket is different in that story than it is here. The small basket, 12 small baskets, versus tw seven large um, kind of duffel bag type um, uh, baskets, really big ones. <laughs> and so... Even, why would you change the words and use different vocabulary in the same story? It doesn't make sense, right? Common sense reading says that this is a different story. The, big, the biggest argument in this is, is that the, the apostles, this, this has to be the same story because the apostles wouldn't have forgotten the goodness of God. Because if you read through this story, they say, well, they, they forget that Jesus provided 5,000. And now we have 4,000 and the apostles are saying, ah, where are we going to get bread, right? That's what let's pick up on that story as we go through it for, for context in verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I said, if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way for some of them have come from afar. And then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Well, if... <laughs> It just happened in chapter 6 that Jesus took the young kid's lunch and turned it into the biggest miracle maybe at this time, in this point of time, right? One of the greatest. What happened? Why did they forget? Did they forget the faithfulness of God? Did they forget the, the power of God? Did they forget that I, I'm, Jesus has to be saying, I just want one person. One of you 12 come to me and say, hey, you did this before. I know you can do this again. Let's, let's figure out how to do that. But they're like, I don't know where we're going to get what we need here in the wilderness. But that, that brings to a point. How many times has God done something for you and you saw the goodness of God and then the very next thing that happened, you forgot all about it and you questioned it again? We talk about Ebenezer Stones, the, this book you're interested in, in writing, right? Ebenezer Stones, you put an Ebenezer Stone there. This is, the, this is the faithfulness of God. And you wonder if they put an Ebenezer Stone out there with the feeding of the 5,000. Is there something out there that you can look down there and say, oh my God, I remember. But these guys didn't remember. Did they not remember? Like, what are the... That's why people think, they think that's dumb. They think it's silly. And so therefore, apparently it has to be the same story because you would have never have made that mistake. But you and I both know that we tend to forget God's goodness as we go into other like-minded situations or whatever else. But I don't think it's forgetful. 
And as we continue to read through here, I think it's a deeper problem than just being kind of forgetful about it. I want to I want to put a term out there because this is in the middle of the time that we're dealing with now, the, the kind of things that our society is fighting against. Could it be that the disciples are prejudiced? Now think about it. If you look back here in the feeding of the 5,000 Jews, the apostles come to Jesus and say, what are we, these guys going to do? They need some food. We need to send them away and get them there because they're going to be hungry. We need to, they're genuinely thinking about their Jewish brethren. But who brings the need up? Who brings it up here in the feeding of the 4,000? It's Jesus. Jesus says, I called him to myself. and said, hey guys, these guys have been with us three days and they don't have any food and I have compassion. Realize the unchanging part of this story is Jesus and his compassion for the needs of other people. Very good point. We need to remember as a servant, we need to be compassionate to people's needs. Okay, so what does he do? He says, Jesus says, he, call, he pulls these guys to himself and he says, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. But these guys aren't thinking about, the, they're not thinking about the Gentiles. It's almost like they, they're surprised at this point. Jesus, well, Jesus wants to, you're a rabbi and you're not supposed to go into a Gentile house. It's against the law. But Jesus, Jesus has to tear these walls down. Between, no partiality between Jews and Gentiles. There's no partiality in God's eyes. And Jesus has to get it through the brains of these men. Why? Because Jesus' primary deal wasn't to come here and teach the gospel. His primary deal is to come and die for your sins. But nobody would understand what that meant unless he told you first. He has, to, he has to bring it, sell these guys on it, so that they'll die for it, so he can die and go home. That's what he has to do. But if it still continues, if the prejudice continues, they will never get out of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to make the argument that it still doesn't work. Because without the Holy Spirit in their hearts, Peter, all the way to Acts 10... When he finally understands that God shows no partiality when he's there dealing with the centurion who's saved, who gets the Holy Spirit. Then he finally marches back to Jerusalem in chapter 11 and battles it out with those guys and tells them, well, that God shows no partiality. Yeah, that's what he's been trying to tell you. So I have a feeling, and, it's, and it's, it's almost an uncomfortable feeling, but it's one we need to know. Why? Because the Bible is sharp and it's powerful. These guys are being somewhat prejudiced to the people they think are below them. Because Jesus is there, but they don't have the Holy Spirit in them to tell them how they work, right? But this, it's the Spirit of God that allows us to know who we are. It's the Spirit of God that allows us to, to know exactly who that is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 kind of talks about that. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 10. And I've been, this is just such a kind of a cool spot. If I can find it here. It says, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I don't know your spirit. I don't know any person's spirit. I know my own spirit, but not yours. 
the same way. God knows his spirit. We don't know God's spirit, except for the fact he shared it with you. That if you are a not a natural man, if you're a spiritual man, the spirit is within you. And because he's in you and he speaks to you, you understand the spirit of God. And so Jesus understands the Spirit of God, but these men don't because the Holy Spirit's not upon them yet. Only after Acts 2 and the church comes upon him and then he goes out to the centurion and, get, and the Holy Spirit falls upon his, his buddies and his family does he actually in, uh, understand that God shows no partiality. But Jesus continues to bang on and press on. He's so, he's so kind and he's so gracious to us. He has compassion. God has compassion. Did you know Jesus uses compassion? He either uses the word compassion or it's involved immediately upon Jesus showing or feeling compassion 13 times in three gospels. The word compassion is not in John for some reason. But 13 different times he either feels compassion or he acts upon feeling compassion. Compassion is a cool word. I'm going to try to say what it, I'm, try, I'm going to try to pronounce it in the Greek. It's splangnizoami. And what it means is, is it's the moving deep in the bowels. It is understood in Greek culture and in Hebrew culture that deep in the bowels was the seat of love and, and pity. And, and just in a general English sense, compassion is the consciousness of something that you feel is wrong and the desire to alleviate that problem you could feel bad about someone and not care you could try to fix something but not feel about it but in this case compassion is the idea that you see a need and you wish to fix it and jesus was the champion of compassion and he has compassion on these people now. Now, there's no reason to believe that these people are starving, that they weren't out there three days with no food. But he sees the physical need. Jesus sees that these guys need food. There's 4,000 people out there. That's 4,000 men. Could be 15,000 people out there. He sees the physical need. And that brings me to a point. Do you see the physical needs? Sometimes we, we get lost in the spiritual idea about the Bible. And we read it and we say, wow, this, what's the spiritual, what is the spiritual lesson that you get out of it? Well, what about the physical lesson that you get out of it? I, I heard this week uh, another pastor talk about a story. He said that, a, that a, a missionary was teaching in another culture. Another culture had never heard the gospel before. And he's reading the story of Jesus walking on the water. And so when he reads this, he turns to these people and he says, what, did, what do we glean? What spiritual truths do we know about Jesus walking on the water? And they're like, well, he's really powerful. He can walk on the water. Because they saw the story as not figurative. They saw it as a reality that Jesus walked on water. And, and that pastor started to think, well, sometimes I just look past the amazingness of the story. Jesus cared because these people were hungry. That's the same as everyone out here. Where can we be that person? Where can we see that people have physical needs? Now, now we, we have to be careful. What does it say in James chapter 2? James chapter 2 talks about physical needs. I'll read it to you. <laughs> James chapter 2 says this, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you don't give him the things in which he's needed for the body, then what does it profit? Sometimes we get ourselves so swept away in Christianese and legalese and wordies, right? And all these things about, about all this stuff we, we, we wish to be a part of that we fail to take care of the physical needs of people. And although it is true that it says in, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that it's first physical and then it's spiritual, 
Jesus sees both sides of the coin. He always does. He sees these people are hungry and he wants to provide for them. And he calls his guys to him and says, how are we going to handle this problem? These guys are hungry. That's been three days. By the way, if they go away, uh, they could fall and faint. If I send them away hungry, they may faint. Now, the spiritual aspect of that is kind of cool. We'll talk about it in a minute. But the, the physical thing is, did you know, I just did some reading, that if you, if you uh, fast for three days, your body's metabolism changes in three days. You start to starve in three days. Now, you can live for a long time without food, but your body starts to change in three days. These guys come to him and say, well, I don't, I don't know. What we, where are we going to, I don't know how to get these. How do we get this food? Now, what's the spiritual aspect of this that, that I wanted to point out to you the word for faint. It's the word ekluo. And not only does it mean uh, to relax or to be weak, but it also means to be unloosed or to be faint hearted. When was the last time you failed to eat nourishment of the bread of life and you felt loosed and unfainted? Jesus speaks still in the spiritual as, the, as we see in a physical realm, they're hungry. In a spiritual realm, they're still hungry because as we always talk about back in the 5,000, they look like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't have a leader. They didn't have anyone to lead them. And who, where do they do? They, they you wander off into whatever horrible things you get involved in when you don't have the nourishment to keep you upright, when you become unloosed. So Jesus calls them and says, well, what are we going to do? He says, then his disciples answered him, verse four, how, by the way, how, the word how is kind of interesting. It means how or where. How are we going to do it? Where are we going to do it? Generally, how are we going to find enough food to feed all these people? How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Interesting that this could or could not be a prejudicial statement. You people, these people, how do we, how do we handle these people? How do we get them what they need? Where are you guys? What are you doing? And look who doesn't skip a beat. Jesus does. Well, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Remember the first story? They went out and got somebody else's lunch. Ah, we got this kid's lunch and let's spread it out upon them. But Jesus said, what do you have? And we'll, I'll, I'll show you another spot where I think there's a prejudicial thought here. He said, what do you have? He says, I have seven loaves of bread. Seven loaves, that's what I have. So, so what does it say? And they have, he said seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish. Now, Matthew mentions that the fish and bread are together. But in this story, he gives him seven bread, he breaks it, blesses it, gives it out, and then the fish show up. And other commentators made the, made the thought process, did, did they keep the fish back? Until they saw that Jesus was going to do something miraculous with the bread? How much are you keeping back from Jesus? Jesus says, bring it all. Give me everything. No matter how big or how small, give it all. I will make it work. I'm appreciative of the fact that Jesus didn't break it and Jesus is distributing it out to people. Look what it says. It says, gave them to his disciples to set before them. Jesus gave to his, his apostles. His apostles distributed it to the people. He they brought their stuff to Jesus. Jesus multiplied it. He gave it back to those guys and they distributed it. That's what we do. We distribute the word of God, the bread, because Jesus is the bread of life. 
the bread of life, we, we need to check it out. John chapter 6, verse 51. Because it's awesome. I love the book of John. And so John chapter 6, verse 51. Just so you can see it in your eyes. 51 says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give in my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus was so bent on giving himself. So awesome. Loved it. And he had men teaching them to do the same. By the way, you need kind of a face to an idea here, much like pastors. So Jesus gives it to, to the men of his apostles, his apostles, the face of the church, distributing at why we see that in Acts when they pull the seven, you know, they get the seven men uh, to include Stephen to take care of the women so that the apostles could continue to to study there there is so much here that is so important about serving our communities now think about it what are all those things we keep hearing those terms we keep hearing because we're dealing with jews and gentiles but our but our, we are so good <laughs> we're so good at dividing ourselves Jews, Gentiles, Democrats, Republicans, Apple, Android, right? We, all of these crazy things, that's not what God's heart is. What are the words that we hear in the news today? Bigotry, racism, white supremacy, white privilege, ethnocentrism, toxic masculinity, anti-Semitism. You know, we're dealing with a lot of stuff, but that's not our heart. Our heart has to be to serve, to bring what we have, the talents we have, the, the aspects we have, the finances we have, everything that we have, we bring it all to Jesus. Jesus manipulates it and multiplies it and sends it back to us to give out to others. The reason why the two stories are in here is because we have to cover both sides of humanity. And oh, by the way, Jesus can provide for both sides of humanity. And everyone has to come to Jesus to truly be fed. Both sides of humanity. And so when we go back out here as a police officer, a fireman, a parole, jail, whatever it is, who are we looking at that's not on your side of humanity? The mentally ill, the alcoholism, drug addicts. Because there's a whole bunch of people out there that need help. And the minute we start to divide and conquer, we're in trouble. Jesus made sure it's clear. The, the end of John, it says that Jesus had done so many things that there you couldn't be enough books written in the world of Jesus did. He may have multiplied meal after meal after meal after meal a hundred different times. So why is it here in a cross section of miracles here by Jesus? Why is it mentioned? Because to look at the entire heart of God in a very specific way, Jews and Gentiles are together. There's no partiality with God. It says they put it in there and they, they also had a few small fish. God, that, that, that makes me angry. I, I don't know why I'm so angry at that statement. Mark, Matthew doesn't write it that way. He says he brought him fish and he, he blessed the fish and the, the fish and the bread together and gave it out. But, but Mark wrote mark, mark wrote it that way mark wrote it that they brought the bread they sat them all down they distributed it and then they brought some fish and then he blessed that and he distributed that and maybe that's just because maybe secretly in all our hearts we we still have that we still have that piece of 
of wanting that we won't ever get rid of until we stand before the Lord, right? Then the, then the mirror is not dimly. He sees us and we see him as, it, as we are. Verse 8, so they ate and were filled. By the way, the word filled and the word satisfy up in verse 4 are the same word. This isn't just filled. This is gorged. Greatly pleased by how much you just ate. So blessed that you got everything that you want and then some, and then you left it in seven giant hampers worth of food. A hamper, that's the word that I was looking for earlier. Hamper of food. <clears throat> so they ate and were filled and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. And now those who had eaten were about 4,000. And he sent them away immediately, got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. We have to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Jesus is walking through Gentile country. This is, we're talking against the law. And when you understand that Jesus said, wow, well, you know, I, you don't put old wine, new wine into old wineskins, you need a new wineskin, right? Because we're doing something new, new, new. This is all new. And these guys, these guys have got to be wide-eyed, their jaws dropped to what Jesus is doing because they've grown up not believing any of them. They believed what they believed. But to pull down these walls, there are walls in this city that we need to work to help to pull down. Because the news alone is building walls. And that's what they want. That's what Satan wants. He wants to put us on a on, a, on, a, on an island. Instead of bringing us together in church and gathering and really understanding about what's going on, he's trying to segregate us and separate us. Look, we serve everyone. Jesus provides us the truth of the gospel, the bread of life, the water of the spirit. He provides us the ability to give physically to people who are in need physical then the spiritual we take care of both so does jesus that's what he's called us to do and at what point do we say you know what forget forget our own self we got to die to ourselves, and we need to walk out there and take care of them because they're sheep without a shepherd i'm tired of the division i'm tired of the fighting the name calling and I, and, I, and, I, and I pray that the Lord would come back soon and bring that to, 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 so we could truly see what it means to see a government that's run the way it's supposed to be run. But until then, because we don't know that day, let's bring some fish and some bread. Let's give it to Jesus to multiply all that he can bring to us and let's, let's serve in a community, whether that's by prayer, whether that's by supplication, whether that's all these things, that's what we do. Because we're in a specific situation. We're in a specific places doing specific roles. Each person here, and then Chris who's not here, and, and Fred who's not here, we all have specific roles in this community that we can pull together and do amazing things. We're running out of time. We got work to do. There is a busy and very heavy workload ahead. And the workers are few. Let's, let's charge it today to look at both sides of the aisle and pull it together in unity. Not the unity that they're talking about, but the unity in Christ. Because only Jesus can bring unity. That's our job this week. To not look at people the way we think they are. Not to look at people the way society says they are. Not to look at people because it's hot.
hogwash. Because God made people in his image. Everyone. Jew and Gentile alike. As Pastor Zach Adams said, it's the peanut butter and the jelly and the sandwich. If you don't count one or the other, you got a peanut butter sandwich. But to have the whole, the whole spectrum of everything that God has created, we need to, that, we need to go after all of it. And we need to have a heart to do so. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. And you know, Lord, my heart for the way that things are going, Lord. And we're such a we're such a, a kind of a dynamic crew doing things and being in places, Lord, that you've placed us in. To be the tip of the spear in so many different places. Lord, use us. Manifest your love in us. Take what you've given us, multiply it, and let us distribute it to all those who who you put in our path. It says, it says in Ephesians 2.20, it says that we are your workmanship, that you have made us for good works. Those good works are already out there. They're waiting for us to walk through them. You've already planned them. It doesn't matter where we are, they're there. But Lord, we need eyes to see and ears to hear what you're speaking. And we need, Lord, to be in prayer more than ever. And we need to hear your voice So, Father, protect us this week in each and every place that we go. Let us see your glory in whatever we do because it's yours. You tear down the walls. Help us to do it so that we could be ambassadors for you, Lord, representative of you, Lord Jesus. So, Father, we come to you. We, we're thankful and grateful for the, for the souls in this room today and those who would listen later. And we pray, Father, that you would bless each and every one of us, that we would walk in the Spirit, that we would hear your voice. It is in the name of the King that we pray. Amen.